Hey, I'm Doug Stillers, the ACT Developer Program. Balsu, Oliver, and Jimbo give you a good background in guy as well as to why optimization is important. So let's just get straight in to why optimization is important. And uh, if we could still have my slides here in the middle, that would be awesome. There we go. Awesome. Great. Alright, so what we're going to do right now is if you don't have Arrow on your computer, this is a great time to get Arrow downloaded on your computer. We're actually going to walk through the Arrow Analyzer tool, which is how you actually find out how your app works. Um, we have a bunch of traces that we're going to walk through. If you don't have the traces, raise your hand. There are USB sticks that also can use, use to open a beverage in the evening if you're interested. Uh, raise your hand. We've got a bunch of them around. They work both ways. I have transferred data and I have partaken. Um, so we're going to actually run a trace using the arrow analyzer, or the data collector. We're going to collect a simple trace. We're going to walk through the data analyzer. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at some apps that are actually out there. These are apps that probably you guys have in your pocket on your phone right now. And we're going to see how optimization can make those apps better. And these are apps that have millions and millions of downloads, so everybody can optimize. It's out there for everybody, so we're going to give you some optimization strategies from those. We're going to learn some tricks using Arrow to do some of that optimization, and we're going to cover seven of the best practices. I could try to cover all 12, but they gave me only an hour, so that's, that's what we're doing. So let's start off with uh, running a quick trace. So, what we're gonna, so when you're running a trace with Arrow, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. You can use the arrow, the Android emulator on a PC, and that's what I'm going to do over here. You should be able to see it on the, the two side screens over here. Um, you can also take a Android device that has a developer ROM on it, and you can. We have the APK out on our GitHub. You can download it, install it, and run your test on an actual physical device. If you want to do other platforms, because there are other people sitting in the other sections of this, the room here, and you may be interested in other platforms. If you collect a PCAP trace using something like Instruments or Netmon or Wireshark. And another trick that I've used uh, when I'm not in front of my computer is I set up my Android phone as a hotspot and then Wi-Fi. The Android phone collects all the data and then we can look at it and we analyze it. So let's start off real quick with taking a simple trace. The, um, this is the arrow analyzer tool. If you notice up at the top, it says there's a data collector menu. If I hit start collector and I have an emulator open, it'll ask me to name my trace my name in dev lab. You can see it records video. What we're doing here is it's recording the screen at three frames per second. And the reason it's doing that is it syncs that with your trace, which is really awesome when you're looking at a trace three weeks later and you have no idea what the heck you did three weeks ago. It's all there in video. So I'm gonna hit start. It's starting the Android, it's starting the trace on the emulator. Okay, the Android emulator started, so now I can open up my emulator here. And uh, I'm just going to go to, to google.com, uh, if it lets me. Oh, I don't know what it's doing here. All right, so what we're going to do, let's just search, let's, let's learn how to do search. Anyway, the idea is when you're testing your app, you want to test functions that the customers are using. You want to test all the features. You want to treat it like you're a real customer. You want to see how your app is behaving to the people who are using your app. So once you've done a bunch of clicks, I'm just in the browser here clicking buttons on my emulator. Um, when I'm done, I can come back to the, the arrow analyzer tool, the data collector, and now there's a choice that's highlighted called stop collector. This is really easy. This is not rocket science. It stops the collector. <coughs> And then when it's done, it's done. So we're just going to let this finish up. Um, what we're going to look at, if you want to open up Arrow, and if you're not, I'm going to be running it over here on the side so you can, you can follow along there. We're going to open up a trace. And so uh, we're going to look at this application called Connection Test. And what Connection Test is doing is, uh, as, as Shubo mentioned, many applications we notice don't close their connections right away. And I grew up in Cleveland, and when I was a little kid, I'd come in in the winter, and I'd take off all of my, you know, all of my winter jackets and hats and mittens, and I'd leave the front door open, my parents were like, you're wasting energy, shut the door. And now I do that to my kids, even in Seattle. Um, 
This is the same idea. When you're done with your mobile connection, close your connection. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. Uh, so we see in our traces, what we study, over 50% of apps have this issue. This is widespread. It's pretty easy to fix, and we'll, and we'll walk through that really quickly. And so in the connection test trace that we have, that you guys all have on the USB sticks, we're going to look at closing connections, and then we're also going to look at, because this is a sample app that I built, it, it doesn't have a cache. And so we'll talk about duplicate content, and we'll talk about uh, in, improper cache headers. So now let's go to the arrow tool, go to open trace, and on the SD uh, card that you have, there's a trace called Connection Test 62. So if you're on a Mac, just highlight the folder and hit open. If you're on a PC, you can open the folder. And it looks empty. If you hit open, it still works. You'll get an error message like this. This error message is because I recorded this trace in the emulator. That's what's saying is there's no GPS, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no battery, there's no screen events. That's because it was on the emulator. You can't record it there. So just hit OK. It'll open up the trace. If you're having any issues, there are people around here who can help just raise your hands. All the guys with the yellow lanyards are arrow experts, and they're around the back if you're having any issues. But let's start at the front. If you'll notice, there are four tabs in the arrow analyzer tool. So we're going to walk through how, you, how I do an analysis really quickly. If we look on the front screen here, you can see there's a lot of information. I took the trace just a couple days ago. Um, you can see that I took it on the emulator, and we're modeling 3G and a Samsung Captivate. So what I've done is we're actually using energy models based on the energy profile of those devices. You can see it was a short trace, 2 minutes, 226K, burned through 20 joules of energy. Scroll down just a small little bit. And you'll see a lot of green check marks and red X's. And I'll leave you guys to figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad. Hopefully it's not that hard to figure out. If you scroll down even a bit more on this page, we have details about each one of our best practices. Why you pass, what the tests are, and why you passed or failed. So you'll notice here on duplicate content, I passed. The only reason I passed is if there's a threshold of duplicate content before you fail, and I didn't cross that threshold, because I know, I can tell you, I promise you, I did not build a cache in this app. But let's look at cache control. In the results, it says AT&T Arrow has no cache headers 50% of the time. And that's because I downloaded two files. I downloaded HTML and a JPEG, and the HTML has no cache header. So we'll go into that, and we'll actually see that file, and how we can optimize the app to prevent that from happening again. So. Now we can head up, you see the three, four tabs up at the top, we're going to hit the overview tab. And the overview tab has a lot of information here, so I'm going to run through it real quickly. The first big graph on the, on the left side is the file types. Just looking at the MIME types, the type of files that were downloaded during the trace. In this case, big image of my dog and a uh, small text file, HTML file. Then we're going to look at trace benchmarking and connection statistics on the, on the right. Benchmarking, we're grading you against 150 other traces on your, your average throughput rate. The energy consumption and the signaling overhead. Signaling overhead is how many times you go from idle to DCH or from fast to DCH. That creates a lot of signaling on the network. You kind of want to minimize that. And the idea here is the more blue you have, the better. And this is just too ironic. Battery critically low. Isn't that awesome? Just beat that right now. All right. Uh, connection statistics, again, the more blue, the better. You want to try to have as many sessions terminate properly. In this case, I have some of them doing it. It's 50% on purpose because I'm not closing them properly on purpose. Connections tightening groups, non-periodic and large bursts. Send all the data in big chunks. And so in this case, I passed the bill a little bit. Let's look at the middle graph, which is called duplicate content. And you can see it's big down here in the, in the bottom of the screen. You may notice that on your trace that you have open, it looks a little different. And that's because these are tables, and you can sort by clicking on sort it by time, or by file name, or file size. And so in this case, it's sorted by, I think, file name. So what you can do is if you actually look here, you can highlight any of these images. And what you'll notice is this view button just became highlighted. If you click that, you'll see a gorgeous picture of my dog, Dory. So there she is. Um, this is great. In this case, if you look on my trace, it's pretty straightforward that the image is called watchdog.jpg, but in a lot of apps, 
it's like a hash. You know, you can't tell what the heck the file is. So it's nice to be able to actually see what the file is to figure out what on earth is going on in your trace. All right, and now we have one more table down here at the bottom. And, uh, oops, it's not there, so just, we're gonna just look at this last table at the bottom. These are your access domains. So this is showing every single domain that my app hit. And uh, in this case, it's a very simple app. It went to this great website called silversfamily.com. It has a picture of my dog on our homepage. It's really exciting. Anyway, if you click the access domains, you'll see that Sillers Family had four TCP sessions. When I highlight it, it lists all four TCP sessions here on, on, the, on the bottom. And so what my application was doing is I made two connections to SillersFamily.com. The first time I closed my connections properly, and the second time I just, I didn't say anything, I just let the device do what it needed to do to close the connections. So let's look at this column right here that I have my mouse over. It's called the session close delay. That's looking at the last packet that sent data and the closed connection and how much time was between those. So the first two pings, uh, the first connection was to download the HTML and it closed within five milliseconds. And the second one was to download the picture of my dog. It closed within two milliseconds. And then I just let the device do what it needed to do on the second round. And you can see it took 10 seconds and then 9.8 seconds. That's just extra battery. That's me as a small child leaving the door open in the middle of winter in Cleveland, Ohio, and watching all the heat just going right out the door. All right, so now we've looked at that. Let's head to the diagnostic tab, and we've seen some graphs that look like this already. Um, let's walk through what we're seeing here. You may actually see, you can actually see her on my screen. It looks different than what's up here on the screen. We see that there's a GPS data at the top. So I want to show you how to add that. So if you go to View, and you go to Options, there's all sorts of great things that we're recording when we run a trace. The GPS state, the radio state, the Bluetooth, the camera, the screen, the power, the Wi-Fi. Let's just add GPS. So I just click GPS, I'm going to click OK, and now I match over there. The other thing we're going to see here is I'm going to just scratch this in a little bit. There's also a video going on, and so we can see what was happening at every single time during the trace. You can see I jumped to this spot, and the little blue hash went up to 70x seconds. As you can see, that's exactly that moment in the trace. That's the video screen capture. All right, so we got the throughput. You know, that's showing you how much data. Packets up, packets down. We've got bursts. And what bursts are is kind of grouping the packets into forests, forests from the trees sort of idea. If you hold your mouse over, to, over the burst, it will tell you what kind of burst. In this case, it's saying that it's a user input burst. So how do we know it's a user input burst? Well, let's look right underneath there. I hit the screen. You can see that we're recording user input. I made a key press, and then the network went. So Arrow assumes that obviously that happened because of a, of a network interaction. And then let's look at these bursts out here, these blue connections out here. This is a TCP control. These are me not closing the connection and then the cleanup, either from the device or from the network saying, okay, that connection's open, we gotta close the connection. That's these packets up here at 100 seconds. And then finally, at the very bottom, we're modeling the state machine, and you saw the animation uh, when Oliver was giving his demonstration. So then we show down here every single TCP flow. This is every connection that was made during the trace. And you can see in this case, they're all sealersfamily.com. If you scroll up and down, you can see every connection. Let's go to the bottom and click the one at 90.445 seconds. What you'll see when I click that, the little hash guy went out here to 90.44 seconds. The video went immediately to 90.44 seconds. Unfortunately, my screen is really small here, so I can't show everything at once, but there is, there is a Miss Dory in her, in her Excellence. And then down at the bottom, we have information about this TCP connection. So let's walk through it. There are three tabs at the bottom of the overview tab. And we're looking at the request response. So the first thing we see is, hit the, I hit the button. There was a request made to stillersfamily.com for kid photo slash watchdog. Then there was a response, 200 content OK for him is JPEG, 106, 105, 106 kilobytes. 
If we highlight that, again, you can view it, and there's Dory again. Um, let's go to the second tab here, the packet tab, the packet view. So now what we're looking at is every single packet back and forth in this TCP connection. If you then come all the way down and scroll all the way down to the bottom, what we can see here is this packet 297 was the last pack for information. It was sent at 91.6 seconds. And then the closed connection was sent at 101 seconds, so about 10 seconds late. This next packet here, and what you'll see is again, this guy jumped out. 10 seconds later, we closed the connection, causing this extra delay, this extra battery drain from your app. Finally, we have a content view. And what the content views are showing you all the requests and responses, and it'll actually show you the files if they're text. And what we can do is if I scroll down here, what you can see is that I do have a cache control header here. And my cache control header has a max age of 1.43 million seconds, so that's about 16 weeks. So this image my thought was taken in 2004, so I think 16 weeks of cache time is probably appropriate. I'm not going to change that photo. Um, and if you scroll on even for, further, you can see um, you can see I took this with an Olympus digital camera back in the day in some of the you know the headers in the image file. It was a two megapixel camera back way back in the day. All right. So then we have one more tab to look at, and I'm just going to look at this really quickly. This is the stats tab. Oodles of information here, caching statistics, um, RRC simulations. I'm going to focus on the burst analysis right here. And remember, we colored the different bursts, the green was user input, and the blue was TCP control. And in this case, TCP control is not closing the connections right away. Well, let's look right here in the middle. 21.9% of the energy of the battery usage of my app was because I didn't close the door right away. That's pretty significant, and that's actually a fairly standard number looking at top apps in the base in the various markets. So this is something that's huge and it's an easy fix. Okay, so then let's talk a little bit about connection tests because we have this trace in front of us. Um, and let's look at, let's go back to the diagnostic tab. And, Another thing you can do here is if I zoom in, you can actually look at this section of the trace. And there it is. So this is the, this is this timeout at about 80 to 100 seconds in the trace. And what you can see here is these, this blue connection here from closing the connections in a delayed manner. And there are other places in the trace in, in the arrow tool that will show you that the connections weren't closed right away. Does anyone remember any other places I showed TCP control or where there was a uh, uh, places showing that the connections were delayed in closing. All right, I hope you're following along. I hope that wasn't my, my view. I hope that's my one Euler moment um, from the trace from this today. But the first place I, I would look is uh, in the overview tab, if you recall, down here. It, this connection was closed in a delayed manner. You can see we, we record every connection and show the closed delay. And then finally, in the stats tab, we showed that 21% of the energy was from not closing the connections right away, which is a pretty big number. So the takeaway here is close connections when you're done. Okay. The other thing that we talked about that I showed you, I'll be able to show you here, was cache headers. So I'm going to go back to the diagnostic tab here, and again, we're back at the same location. And then we can look at the cache headers, and if you recall, for the images, I have a cache control header. Say, this image is good for 16 weeks. But if we go one packet, one TCP flow above it to the one at 90.104 seconds, this is for the HTML. And I have no cache header here. So, just me. Oh. So imagine in this trace that I had downloaded the file once and then I didn't need to I wanted to display it from the cache. In this case, it takes two seconds for this file to be downloaded. <coughs> but if it came from the cache, it'd take about 250 to 750 milliseconds. Loading from the cache is a lot faster. 60 to 87% faster. And then now, 
This is where I was going, and I went out of order. This one has a cache header, but the text HTML on the next lit. There we go. No cache headers. So if your file isn't going to change, that HTML file hasn't changed since 2004 because I'm really slow at updating my website. Um, I should have a cache header so that it's stored locally. So I should add a cache header there to make sure that it is cached. And then if you're going to have cache headers and you're going to reuse content, you should build your own cache. And as Chabot and Oliver mentioned, they've looked at all of the different libraries and some of them have good caching and some of them don't. So it's worthwhile to look at their paper to see which libraries you're using and which ones have good caching and which ones don't. Okay, so now we've looked at Arrow. We've run a trace. We walked through the data analyzer a little bit. We saw the four tabs. And we looked at three best practices. So let's look at some published apps. These are apps that are really out there that people are using that you guys have in your pocket. And so we're going to look at startup and how duplicate content, multiple connections, and prefetching can make your app faster at startup, which is when your customers are first seeing your app. So this is a news app. And if I said the name, again, you would know who these guys are. Let's look at this arrow trace. You can see in about 23 seconds, there's a click. And it starts the download of the news feed. And then there's a delay, and then all these images are downloaded. And the page finally renders at almost 60 seconds. This trace isn't out on your computers because, as you can see, when you look at a trace, you'll be able to see what domains we're hitting and what app it is. And I'm not out here to shame anyone. What I want to show is that everybody can use optimization. And so I don't want to give you this trace and say, hey, this XYZ news really, they really stink. You, should, you shouldn't follow what they're doing. I want to show you this so that you can build better apps. So then, this takes 34 seconds. And as we've <coughs> been talking, there's a study showing that people expect mobile content to be there in three seconds. So we're off by a 10x right now. But look at all those gaps. What if we just smooshed it all together? Now we're at 20 seconds. That's 40% faster. But if you even look, there's still a lot of gaps in those packets. What if we smoosh it even more? There's a lot of optimization that can be done here on startup to make this app run faster. So if you manage your connection, you prefetch stuff, and then you close your connections when you're done with them, again, I'm just going to point it out, um, your app is going to be faster. I think there's one more. All right, here's another app. And uh, this is another popular app that you guys have heard of and you guys all have installed on your phone. And what about your customers who come back? What if you cache everything the first time the app starts up so that you don't have a problem on the second startup? This is the second startup. And then the second startup, 626 kilobytes, 20, almost 29 joules, 23 seconds of DCH time. That's equivalent to startup time, 23 seconds to start up the app. All right, so I simulated a cache, and there was a guy up here about an hour ago that has a company that simulates cache. We'll just go with that. This is the same app on second startup when I'm simulating a cache. So the trace, eh, I can't tell the difference, but if you run the numbers, let's look, 427K and 20 seconds to start up. So what is that? That is 33% less data, 10% faster, and 10% less battery if this application properly cached on the second startup. That's huge. All right, one more real quick one here. And I want to show a good example because I hate say negative things. This is another news app. And they prefetch all of the XML, all of the stories come down at the start. So that there's still data moving on later on in the app. That's all images. So they're not prefetching all the images, but all the text is there. So as you move from article to article to article, it's really, really fast. And so this is a great way to make your app fast is by prefetching the right amount of information. Now granted, prefetching is a dual-edged sword. If you do too much, you're killing people's data plus you slow things down. Okay? So prefetch your data intelligently, make sure you're downloading stuff in the right order. So again, we've looked at application, we've run a trace, we looked at connection tests, we looked at the startup, and we looked at a bunch of best practices. So let's go back to that news app real quick. I want to show one more thing about multiple connections and periodic connections. So again, we're at this news app, they prefetch all this data great, looks great. 
One cool thing about Arrow is you can add and remove data based on which app it is and which IPs. I pulled out some data out of this trace to show how great they were prefetching all the news. So let's add that last click in. A little bit out here. Yowzers. This is not news. This is advertising. So they did a great job in prefetching everything, but they have so much periodic connectivity for the, to their advertising SDK that it's draining the battery excessively. Now, I don't want to say bad things about advertising. Advertising is important. I want you guys to get paid. It's really important that you get paid, but don't be, don't go too far with your advertising or downloading a new ad every six seconds because that's frustrating to your customers and it's draining up their batteries. So then again, just like prefetching, you've got a balance. You want to get paid, but if you make it too obnoxious, people will pull, pull away from that. So just watch the advertising behavior. Use tools like Arrow to see how it's affecting the battery life of, of your applications. One more thing about this same application, and we're going to go into a demo real quick, so hopefully you guys haven't all fallen asleep. Downloading a gallery, they're downloading about eight images in this trace. What they're doing is they're doing it in one TCP connection. And the problem with using one TCP connection is it's like going to the grocery store and there are eight people in line and there's only one register open. What if there's an issue with that connection? What if the register goes down? Everyone's stuck. It's slow when there are eight people in one line at the grocery store trying to check out. It's really fast if there are eight registers open and eight people in line. This is the slow way to download content. So what we can do is we can actually open up a trace here in Arrow. I've opened it, I've built a trace, it's called Threaded Download. And so if you open up this trace, again it's called Threaded Download. I built an app that downloads a bunch of images, uh, the images uh, in two different ways. And, and I've always joked that the way to get people to see pictures of your family vacation is to get a whole bunch of people in the room and then just start showing your pictures. So this was London a couple of years ago. You can see the Tower Bridge, you know, real exciting, All right? Anyway, there's two ways that this, this files were downloaded. And if you look here, can you see there's a connection here and a group of connections out here? Does anyone see a difference? Is it too obvious if you guys didn't even say anything? Like, look at the, look at the, uh, you can see how the throughput is amazingly fast where I'm highlighted right now. And over here, it's a nice little mesa. It's nice and slow. The other thing you can look at is in the TCP flows. Let's look here at 11 seconds. I opened up one, two, three. I'm just scrolling. I'm actually not at the top. I apologize. One, two, three. A whole bunch of TCP connections all sequentially. I think they're eight. So I opened up eight connections. I was at the grocery. I run the grocery store. I opened up eight. Uh, I opened up eight cash, cash registers. Everyone went right through all at once. Out over here, I did it sequentially at 26 seconds. So 26, 29, 30, 31. I only had one cash register open, and everybody went through one at a time. Same amount of data is downloaded four times faster the earlier way. So think about threading your connection so that it's faster. Um, the other thing to note is if there's an issue with the TCP connection, customers understand if one image doesn't load, but if eight images don't load, it looks wonky. If your TCP connection locks up on the right, well, none of the images will load, but it might only lose one on the fast way. Um, so that's, that's a great thing. So use the network to your advantage, make sure your threading connections, you know, Six, eight connections is a good way to do that. Um, so now we've looked at a whole bunch of apps, news and apps. We've looked at a bunch of best practices. Now um, let's look at background processes. And we talked about using uh, <coughs> periodic connections. And so this is, a, this is an application, again, that you guys have heard of. And this, this app really angered me because I'm supposed to be the, the optimization expert, and I was running a trace on something else, and all this other stuff is going on in the background. Look at that, that trace, it's insane. Well, remember I, I told you that you can remove the other apps, so I said, well, what on earth is doing this? And this is what I saw. Now, it looks like those are all really high throughput. The one that's highlighted with the little green, with the little blue character, it's like it's really high throughput. That, that connection is 240 bytes. 
These ones down over here by my finger, those are two bytes each. So they opened a radio connection, sent two bytes, and then you went through DCH to the fast array zone for 17 seconds for each one of these. And as I zoom in, you can see it's every three minutes they're just pinging. In 24 hours, if you have this app on your phone, you do nothing else, you don't turn on the screen, it's just sitting there, you're at 80% battery at the end of 24 hours. This app is going to take up 20% of your battery. I guarantee somebody has this app installed on their phone right now. I call this a vampire app because it's just slowly sucking the juice out of your app, so <laughs> out, of your, out of your device. So let's not do that. So how can you manage your vampires? If you use push rather than pull, you can be flexible in your ping time. Got another trace here, another family vacation. All right. Let's open up the trace that you guys have here. It's called periodic fail. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what this app, what this trace is looking at is there's two apps that are running here. And so what I'm going to show you is how to how to to differentiate between the various apps. So if we go to View, and we choose Select Applications IP, we open that, we get a window. And what this is going to show you, these are all the apps that were running during my trace. And so like I said, you can deselect apps that you don't want to see, so I can deselect these two Google apps at the top of my trace. And then you can see there's Android Mail, I'll leave Android Mail in, that's fine. You can see there's an app, Facebook, you guys have probably heard of Facebook. Um, what I'm going to do for Facebook, I'm not going to remove Facebook, but if you come over here to the right in the color, I'm going to turn all the packets for Facebook, I'm going to turn them orange. So I'll be able to differentiate Facebook packets from all the other apps. Then what I'm going to do is, this is my app, it's called Calm Example Modified Ping Handler. I come up with some really awesome names for my apps. I'm going to color that one blue. So again, I just click that gray to the right. Just pick a blue color. And then I'm going to click OK. And what that does is it's coloring the different packets. So you can see that there's, there's blue and there's, there's orange. And you can see, I'll just zoom in here a little bit so it matches what we're seeing on the, on the, on the presentation. What you can see is Facebook's pinging every 45 seconds for some information. And my app is pinging every 60 seconds for some information. And what my app is doing every 60 seconds is it's downloading a new picture of my vacation to Iceland. And so you can see it's pinging every 60, the download and end after 60 seconds. And then it waits 60 seconds and downloads another one. And you can see that they're just kind of not in concert with one another. The radio is turning on just kind of whenever the radio needs to turn on. So what if I made my app, so then we can see that in this trace, between 100 and 375 seconds, 245K and 108 joules of energy. So what if I made my app flexible in its ping time and I said, I want the data after 60 seconds, but if the radio turns in between, if the radio turns on at 30, download it then. Then it can download inside these gray, these blue windows in the trace. And so, in the first download, it would have been faster, but in the second one, and the third one, it would have downloaded a lot faster. So, I have an app. I did. I built my app to be able to do that. And so, if you go to the next slide, if you want to open up periodic pass trace, you can. We'll do. What we do is we do the same coloring. You want to just get going? Here it goes. What I did is in this case I said, hey app, be flexible. Ping somewhere between 30 and, uh, and 60 seconds. More click. And what happens is again, here Facebook is, is orange. My app is, is blue. And you can see how much cleaner this is. My app is now being flexible. It's downloading whenever the connection opens. Over here at 125 seconds, it downloaded with my email, because my email's checking every five minutes too, right? These phones are connecting all the time anyway, so piggyback with other connections. What we see here, if you look one more, I'm sorry, this one. 625 kilobytes, it was, I don't know, 245 last time, and 70 joules instead of 108. So take away my app, my being a little more flexible, downloaded two and a half times more data, but used 35% less power. So we worked with Zynga, and they built a transaction manager in their app, because they found just in their app, 
they had SDKs just kind of going, you know, hey, I need an ad, let's get that, hey, let's do some analytics, hey, let's, let's get a new, uh, let's get a new uh, uh, puzzle for, for, for the player. And they grouped all their data together, and they saved 40% of the energy from their Words with Friends app. So this is something that, you know, this is a great example, but it really happens in real life, too. So, we've gone through, we've looked at error, we ran a trace, we looked at a bunch of apps, we've looked through a bunch of best practices, and now I want to look at a transit app. And uh, Faber Nobel, who is helping AT&T run this event, built an application for RITP, which is Paris Transit. And they're letting us, if you guys want, we can share, we're sharing this trace with you guys, we can actually walk through a real app and see how this real app is actually behaving. And what we're going to see here is that there's still some improvements in this app, and they're being very generous for letting us kind of nitpick them in front of a group of developers, but duplicate content, multiple connections, closing connections, and screen rotation. So, RATP is a transit app. Transit apps are kind of like the ultimate mobile app, right? You're out and about, you want to know when the bus is coming, or you want to know where the local station is, or if there are any delays, or get a trip planner. I mean, it's the best app. I use mine all the time in Seattle. It's great. What we can do is we can actually open up the RITP trace in Arrow. It's on, the, it's on the, the memory sticks that you guys have. <coughs> and one thing about this trace is it's a real app. So, let's simplify what we're looking at a little bit, because there's a lot of information here. And what I want you to do is, let's select a time range. Let's simplify this. Let's only look at a specific region. So if you go to View and select Time Range, let's look between 350 seconds and 450 seconds. If you want to look at the whole thing and just zoom into that region, that's cool too. It doesn't really matter. But what this lets us do is now we can focus on this one section of the RATP app. Now I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on here. One really, not quite ready for that yet. Just the, one cool, so here we are at about 367 seconds. We're looking at, this is a select line. We want to get the root map. And so like I said, there's a video. So, I apologize for the, the screen size here on my, on my thing, but if you hit play here, we can actually walk through what this looks like. So, you can see I'm scrolling up and down on my app, and now right now, I select route one. And let's see what happens. la di da di da wait for a map. There it is, all right, cool. All right, so that took 10 seconds. Remember, three seconds is the rule. You want stuff to load as fast as you can. Ten seconds, what if, I'm, what if the subway is pulling into the station and I'm like, is this the right one? And the subway leaves before the thing loads, right? You're waiting another five, ten minutes for another, for another train. All right, so what's going on under the hood? Well, we've got the trace here. This is awesome. We can figure out exactly what's going on. So. Again, at 374 seconds, there's a ping. And so what is this request for? Can anyone, if you can see it here, or if you're looking on your PC, at 374 seconds, there's a TCP connection. Can you tell me what that connection is for, looking at what's there? I'm at 374 seconds, and I've highlighted it right here. And this is the request response to you. Can it's not not yet. It's an ad. And the, the, what's giving it away that it's an ad is the domain is ad.addictmedia.mobile something. So I'm assuming it's an ad. That's just my guess. But you know, when it says ad.something. So again, advertising is super important. But what is the content that people want? Maybe you ask for the ad second. That's just, you know, just me thinking um, out loud. 
Then there's a, what we can do is we can follow through what happens next. So if you scroll down, there's another connection here. And uh, don't, not, don't click yet, but what's this second connection for? Can anyone see, can you see it? It's a request for the image, but is it a request for the image? I'll highlight, I'll put my, my mouse over a little hint right there. It's asking for the headers. It's asking for the headers only. And so this is, this is a caching technique, but what they're doing is I believe if we actually look at the content view and we look at the header, there's a cache control time here, but there's also an E tag. So what I think they're using is they're using an e tag. They're requesting the e tag, and then they look in the cache to see if the file's there. This is a great way to do caching on a PC, but on mobile, you had to wait two seconds to open the connection. You had to make the request, get the request back to get the e tag, and then go look in the cache to see if it's there. So then decide if you need to download the file or not. If you just looked in the cache for the file name, 250, 500 milliseconds. All right. And then finally, at 377 seconds, now we have the request for the image. Sorry about that. So now, it's, we're three seconds in and we've requested for the image. And so I alluded to earlier that I have kids. And there are times where we say, okay kids, we're leaving in 20 minutes, make sure you're ready and in the car in 20 minutes. And after 15 minutes, you go into their bedroom and they're still in their pajamas and they're still playing the game, right? Your customers expect the file in three seconds, and you ask for it in three seconds, right? Now this is acting like my kids who are sitting in, the, in their pajamas till they're not ready to go. The customer's thinking, this should be here already, why isn't it here yet? And the, the app is just now asking for it. Finally, 10 sec the next request is at 300, it's, it's now 377, we asked for the image. It's downloaded here in, in the yellow connection after 10 seconds. And then, just to add insult to injury, in blue, the connection wasn't closed right away. So there are a couple of things that can be done to optimize this app here. E-tags is not the most efficient way to do caching. And I think I went ahead of myself here by showing an e-tag earlier, but by using an e-tag, you actually have to make a request, wait two seconds for all the connections to get set up to figure out if it's there or not. So build for speed, make every connection count. Maybe download the image first, look in the cache for the image first. Don't connect if you don't have to, to save power, to save energy, and to speed up your app. All right, so we've downloaded this image. It's a great image. You can see there's I don't know, eight stations on here. What I notice in this is that, and I can, I can do this over here. What I notice is the first thing I'm going to do when I see this, I can tell this is a really wide image, I'm going to turn my phone because this layout isn't probably optimized for a portrait view, excuse me, a landscape view versus a portrait, because just because of all the white space. So what we can do, or remember in Arrow, we can see every single file. And so that's what the whole image looks like. It's a great map. If you have Arrow open, remember you can highlight here and you can view the image. And if you actually look at the whole image, It's a big honking image. It's too big for that screen. I mean, it might be pixelated up. It's actually not too pixelated on this giant screen over here. Maybe it's a little big for a mobile device. Perhaps you could make it that a little bit smaller or download it in sections. Instead of a 175K, download the center chunk that delays first and then maybe a couple more images out so that center image loads right away. Just another way to make that thing load faster. And again, it's a giant image. So, again, build for mobile. Resize your images. I've been talking to developers since the WML days when people had no idea how to build WAP or websites for mobile devices. And they were serving giant images like that over Edge and GPRS. And it's still a problem today with mobile apps. You'd think that by now we would have learned, but we haven't yet. Okay. So I mentioned screen rotation. What's the first thing I did when I looked at this app? When I looked at that image is I turned the screen. And the reason I turned the screen is because I couldn't see the whole image. So if we go over here just a little bit to the right, 
these lime green connections, right over here at 405 seconds, are actually caused by rotating the screen. That caused the radio to turn on. Screen rotation slows down, can slow down your app, and it can waste the battery. So, what we can do is actually look at some of these connections out here at these screen rotations. And what I did is when I noticed that it was hitting the network, because I've been looking at these apps for a long time, so I just kind of went back and forth. And I just watched the little arrows go ding, 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 I'm downloading stuff. And so that's what the trace looked like. And so if we look at 410 seconds, the first connection, and somebody nailed it before, the first request is for an, an ad. The second request is for the header, for the image, to get the e-tag, to see if it's in the cache, to see if they can, don't have to, have to download it or serve it from the cache. In this case, they said, I can serve it from the cache, it's already there. But we've already made the connection. So number one, two seconds, three seconds, two seconds, two seconds. As I rotated it, it was from the cache. They could have said, is it in the cache? Yes, it's in the cache, 250 milliseconds, it's up. But each single time I rotated, I got that little circularly dialing weighty guy saying, hold on a second, let's see if I need to download that file again. Slowing down the app, and then we get it in the view that makes more sense for, for viewing this image. So, one way you can avoid this is if you keep the state constant. You, you, keep, you don't have to rebuild the state every single time when you rotate your phone. There are ways when you build an app to let it handle rotation in, in a good manner. The other thing you can do is, again, avoid those e-tags. If you still connect for the ad, that's fine. But you've got the ad, and then the header, and then you render. It's three seconds before that image is, to let, is, is shown. So, finally, just to conclude, we've looked at a whole bunch of apps here, and uh, looked at how screen rotation, we've looked at all these apps, and so, our best practices are duplicate content, cache headers, prefetching, multiple connections, periodic connections, screen rotations, and closing connections. And if you follow these best practices, you'll speed up your app, you'll conserve battery life, and most importantly, you'll end up with happier customers. And happier customers use your app more, they buy stuff from you more, and they stick with your app a lot more. So it's a good way to make money. And you know, that's kind of why we're all here, right? In the in the you know, in the grand scheme of things.